I got a bit of a cough. If you don't want to catch what I've got, it's best to be just sit. All right, for your own good. Because I'm here talking a lot, and even if I'm not coughing, you might catch what I've got. I don't know what I've got. But what I've got is not a killer. Oh, by the way, is this being recorded? Can I have the copies? Do you mind? Yeah, I'm going to upload them on YouTube. All right. When do I? When can I get them? No. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's let's get. Right. Thanks all for joining us. I'd like to thank Robert before we go on the screen to you. We'll begin with an opening prayer. He's all in us. Whether a father and his son, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the gift of having Robert with us tonight. Um, send your Holy Spirit, open our minds, and we may all learn something. Our Father, who art in heaven. Blessed are thou among Holy Mary, Mother of God, make us sinners now and we are of our death. Amen. Pray for us. Amen. Uh, well, good evening and thanks for coming. And I notice uh, a lot of you have your Bibles with you tonight, which is very good. They, it's not compulsory. Um, but uh, remember why we're here. Uh, we're gaining knowledge, which is very important, but knowledge for the sake of gain, growing in love. Uh, we do Bible studies to, and I'm going to say this all four weeks, okay? Because uh, as St. Paul says, knowledge breeds conceit. It is love that builds, and that's what we're trying to do here. Love of God and knowing and loving Jesus Christ more. We finished last week with verse 38. I'm deliberately going back one verse to connect the bridge, to remind us, uh, and then I'm going to unpack what I see is a major gap in Luke's gospel. Okay. The Virgin Mary says, and Mary said, behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Then Luke goes on to say in verse 39, in those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a city of Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and she greeted Elizabeth. What's missing? That's right. There's a lot missing. And the lot we know partially in Matthew's gospel. Don't we have the confusion of poor old St. Joseph? St. Joseph finds out that Mary is suddenly pregnant. St. Joseph is told by Mary that, oh, there was an angel, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's conceived this child. There's no other man involved. Aren't we told that Joseph didn't believe her? That Joseph wanted to put her away quietly? He's a just man, according to Matthew. And he, if he wasn't so just, he would have had her denounced publicly. 
And what was the punishment for a woman who commits adultery? Even though they're not fully married yet, they're still betrothed. Something much stronger, tighter than engagement. For them to separate up after betrothal, they would have, need, would have needed a formal divorce. We get none of that in Luke. Even though Luke is the most detailed of all the Gospels, the longest of all the Gospels, written in the best quality Greek, written by a man who's done his research, who probably knows Matthew's Gospel, if Matthew's Gospel had been written before Luke, right? But Luke mentions none of it. Luke gives us the impression, Mary says yes with a total loving sacrificial heart, and then I'm going to go down to Judea and help my my cousin, my kinswoman, because she needs help now. And she's excited to do that with great charity. So how does Mary, okay, we've put the two Gospels together like jigsaw puzzles, pieces of a puzzle. And we know that this issue is resolved when the angel Gabriel appears to St. Joseph in a dream and tells him to take Mary as his wife because the child she is carrying is of the Holy Spirit. And that resolves the issue in the mind of St. Joseph. Okay. So, again, Luke, that, ha that takes time to resolve. Luke gives us the impression the next day Mary's going down south. It's not an error in Luke's heart. Okay. It's what we call literary conflation. Luke doesn't have to mention everything. He takes two events that are rather separate in time and brings them closer together in time. That's conflation. All right. There's another issue here as well. Luke doesn't mention who travels with Mary. In those days, Mary rose and went with haste. I don't want to be a cynic here. This is the Holy St. Luke, the Holy Gospel. Mary doesn't travel alone by herself. She's 15 years of age. She's pregnant. It's 140 kilometers from Nazareth to this town in Judah. By the way, again, Luke doesn't tell us what town in the Judean hillside. It's a tradition that says, what town? <laughs> tradition tells us, what's the town Mary travels to? I'm cut on one of the sacerdotal cities. We'll come back to that in a few moments. But Luke doesn't mention the town. It could have been Hebron. That's a sacerdotal city as well. What I mean by sacerdotal cities, one of the 47 cities where the Levites resided. Levites, unlike the other tribes, did not have a geographical territory assigned to them. They are embedded in 47 different cities. If it was Hebron, it'd still be 90 kilometers journey from Nazareth. But if it's Ein Karim, it's a 140 kilometer journey. A girl 15 years of age who's pregnant doesn't travel that journey on the back of a donkey by herself. One commentator I read says the journey took four days. I don't believe it. It took, would have taken seven to 14 days. If it's 140 kilometers, you do it in four days. You're doing 35 kilometers a day. That's very, very hard work. Very hard work and dangerous to be traveling at that pace when you're a pregnant woman. The Egyptian army marched at 20 kilometers a day. Egypt had its ups and downs in its history. The Roman army, when necessary, could march 40 kilometers a day. That's why they conquered the east and the west. To be, have that speed was a great strategic advantage. A woman on a donkey would not have been doing 35 kilometers a day. To be traveling at least seven days, maybe 14 days up to that, between seven and 14. She would have had to have been accompanied. Luke doesn't tell us that she's accompanied. One commentator says it was an older woman. I don't believe that. It would have to be a man. It would be still too dangerous to travel as just women in the outdoors, particularly avoiding Samaria. They would have gone down the Jordan River Rift Valley, then come 
to Jericho and then move, travel westwards from Jericho to Jerusalem, then to Ein Khan. That road between Jericho and Jerusalem was a very dangerous road by way of robbers, brigands, et cetera, et cetera. It is most likely Mary traveled with a man. And like in strict Islamic cultures today, Mary would not have traveled with her boyfriend. That's a no, no, sorry. She would have traveled with a father or a brother or a husband. Now, tradition doesn't tell us Mary has a brother. We don't know if it was her father, but Catholic tradition with a small t, like if you go to St. Mary's Cathedral today and you go to the northern end of the Blessed Sacrament Chapel and you look up to your left, you see the window that depicts the visitation event and the man in that picture that that is on the side of Mary. you got Mary, Our Lady and St. Elizabeth in the middle embracing each other and to the right you have Zechariah as the husband of St. Elizabeth and to the left you have St. Joseph as the husband of Mary. So our small T tradition says it's St. Joseph that accompanies her, but wait, St. Joseph could not have accompanied her unless he was married to Mary. So what we don't have here mentioned, and we have mentioned nowhere in any of the Gospels, is the marriage ceremony between Our Lady and St. Joseph. You probably think, oh, that, they're already engaged, they're betrothed, wouldn't take much. Well, ordinarily, a Jewish wedding was a big deal. When they were betrothed, a woman betrothed as a virgin would have lived under her father's roof for another 12 months before she joined her husband and lived under his roof. In that 12-month period, the, the groom and the father would have negotiated the dowry, which is what the groom has to pay the father as compensation for losing his daughter because their social security were their children, right? Then after that year, if the woman wasn't a virgin, by the way, that was only, it was reduced to a one-month period. Don't ask me why, I don't know. All right. But at the end of that year, St. Joseph would have come with his friends. They would have gone to the house of um, Joachim, St. Joachim, the father of Our Lady, would have picked up Mary, then taken her to the synagogue, had the wedding, and then they would have had the reception. And if you think Lebanese receptions are loud and long, Jewish receptions took five to seven days on average, right? Because now that they're married, they receive, that's why we call it reception. They're receiving not, the, not just the gifts of their friends and relatives, they're receiving the acknowledgement of their now public status as a married couple by all the friends and relatives and the neighboring villages. How, now, we don't have any of that in the text. So this is speculation. Some people would say that Mary, maybe they did get married. They wouldn't have had a five or seven day reception. would have been truncated. That's okay. I'm, really, I'm happy to accept that. There's nothing wrong with that. Right? But then I don't believe commentators who say that she traveled just with another woman. <laughs> Would have been with a man because it, that was necessary for their prote her protection. Right, so into the hill country of the to a city in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah. Now, we, as I said, we were not told by Luke the name of this city, this town. Tradition is telling us it's most likely Ein Kadam. Who's been to Ein Kadam here? Right, I've been a couple of times. Uh, it's not an A-list type of destination in the Holy Land, but it is still significant. And I'm, the group we're taking next year, my role as a Catholic educator, young teachers, we're actually going to Ein Karim on day one. Uh -huh. uh, and on the one side, when you arrive, they take you to a mosque that's been sitting there, built there a couple of hundred years ago on a spot called Mary Spring, and there's water flows there. So you know what, what pilgrims are like, especially if us type go there, we want to drink that water because it's Mary's spring. And we've been somehow, not necessarily miraculous, but, you know, receiving gra actual graces through it, which is true. Yeah. It's good. All right. And then you've got 
the church of the visitation, large stone, wonderful. The front has a mosaic of Mary traveling down from Nazareth and inside really wonderful, wonderful artworks along the walls. And then in, you see on the wall there plaques of different, in different languages of this great prayer that was uttered at the visitation. What was the prayer uttered by Mary at the visitation? Amen. No, the Magnificat. No. The how Mary has been part of what we're looking at. How thou art who art grace, the Lord is with thee. We looked at that last week. And then we're going to have another part of the how Mary. We're going to come across very soon. But one of the greatest prayers that ever came out of the mouth of a human person was the magnificent prayer coming out of the mouth of our lady. And you, you go to different parts of the Holy Land and you see different prayers in multiple languages on, in beautiful mosaic plaques on walls. Okay. All right. The house of Zachariah. It's not the house of Zachariah and Elizabeth. If you're offended by that, it's because this is a very patriarchal society. It's the house of Zechariah. These, these names, by the way, have meaning. We're going to have a look at the names of these six people. There's, there's the Virgin Mary, for certain. Most likely St. Joseph. There's Zechariah, absolutely. There's Elizabeth, absolutely. There's John the Baptist, absolutely. And there's Jesus of Nazareth, absolutely, in this event. There's six people, six names. We're going to look at the meaning of those names. We're going to construct the definition of the gospel through these six names in this one room at this one event. And when, and, and she greeted Elizabeth. So you can imagine in very Middle Eastern style, Mary arrives. We don't knock on doors. We just call out. And St. Elizabeth would have heard Mary's voice. And suddenly she's just enveloped by the Holy Spirit. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the child leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So here we have the child in her womb, which we know as John the Baptist. So <clears throat> this is an actual grace given to Elizabeth. She's filled with this grace. And the child is dancing in her womb. Because the child at six months in her womb has awareness of who has come into the room, who has come into the house. He has awareness that Mary has come into the house and he has awareness that this is a singular grace given to this child, John the Baptist, in the womb. He has awareness of the presence. And I use that word in a, in a theological sense. The presence, the Shekinah has come into the room. The, pre, the glory presence of God in, in human form. And this John the Baptist child has awareness of that. Now, this re, reminds us of another episode back that many centuries earlier with Rebecca, the wife of Isaac. And she's got twins in her womb and they jump as well. And there's Jacob and Esau in her womb. And that event denotes that Jacob will have preeminence over Esau. In this event, the child in Mary's womb will have preeminence over the child in Elizabeth's womb. All right? Isn't, there, isn't this a wonderful defense of, of, of the, the, the humanity of the child in the womb? Our century is distorted. Our century is blind. Our times are evil. Our times dehumanize the unborn. Our times say they're just a collection of selves because we want to, we don't want responsibility. We want pleasure. We want to lust. We want the enjoyment, but we don't want the responsibility. And so we don't want to acknowledge the product of this activity as a human being. So we like, Others in the past who said that blacks weren't human and, and Jews weren't human will ex enslave blacks, will exterminate Jews, and will exterminate the unborn on an apocalyptic scale. Right? And the sadder thing is that you've got Catholic politicians in powerful, powerful positions in the world, very powerful positions in the world, who say that women have the right to destroy the children in their womb. They don't. 
any rights we do have come from God. And God doesn't give life and then give rights to another to destroy that life. All right. This is a war that requires prophets. If John the Baptist was here today, if Elijah was here today, they'll be outside the White House and the Congress in the United States denouncing the Jezebel and Akab that are powerful persons in that country today who are supporting human sacrifice today. Jezebel and Akab were the target of Elijah's preaching and his war against Baalism. And Baalism required human sacrifice, child sacrifice, and abortion is today's child sacrifice. And these Catholic politicians are enabling this child sacrifice today. Um, <clears throat> and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and she exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So this again echoes uh, a praise that was given to Old Testament women in the past to, for example, like Jael and Judith. These were two warrior Jewish women who uh, were responsible for defeating, for killing military enemies of Israel by striking at their heads. And Mary is in the line of these great women and even greater than these great women because she's going to be enabling a greater evil, a greater enemy of God's people, the devil, to have his head struck by the Messiah. Elizabeth here has a knowledge that Mary is pregnant and has a knowledge of the nature of her child. How does she get that knowledge? We don't know. Luke doesn't tell us. We presume that she has her own private special revelation. The same angel who's been involved in all this episode so far has told Elizabeth, that your younger kinswoman has child, and this child is even more special than yours. Blessed are you among women. Now, this is, the, this is incorporated into the Hail Mary. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. <clears throat> and why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Now, normally in this culture, the older gets the respect of the younger. That's how it was for many a millennia in the ancient worlds. In our world today, sadly, it's, it's the other way around. We have a cult of youth. Nothing wrong with being young. Well, we, we attribute wisdom to youth. Actually, you attribute idealism to youth because they haven't yet been corrupted. Okay? But you attribute wisdom to older. In the Latin terms with nova and vetera. Right, new and old, veteran, old. You only get wisdom through experience. In this episode, though, the older is revering the younger. Elizabeth is in her 40s and she's revering someone one third her age, Mary. In, in this humble manner. Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? The term mother of my Lord is the critical term here for us. You know, you're going to be told, if you haven't been told already, that we shouldn't call Mary mother of God, that this is a blasphemy. How could God have a mother? Are you saying Mary is greater than God? Mary pre-exists God. Mary created God, all that. As we all know it's nonsense. The biggest defense for the term mother of God comes out of the mouth of St. Elizabeth when she's under the influence of the Holy Spirit. You're the mother of my Lord. Now, for strict Jews, they only had one Lord. The Jewish creed, like the Islamic creed, is a very short creed. One sentence. Shema. Listen, O Israel. It's from Deuteronomy 6. Listen, O Israel. The Lord your God is one Lord. There's only one Lord. In ancient Israel. Now, the name of that Lord could only be said by the high priest once a year in, on the feast of Yom Kippur, and that was Yahweh. And the term here is Adonai. That's been it's used here. You're the mother of my Lord. You're the mother of my Adonai. You're the mother of my God. The term here, Lord, in the context of this passage, 
Every, it's surrounded by Lord, Lord, Lord. And every time the word Lord is used here, it relates to God. So it wouldn't be any difference with, with respect to what Elizabeth is now saying about the Mary's child. You're the mother of my Lord. You're the mother of my Adonai. You're the mother of my God. Now, this is something that is otherworldly. Elizabeth's child is miraculous in a real sense. God intervenes to enable it to happen naturally through the seed of Zechariah. But Mary's child is of a different order. This is why the greatest saints, and fathers of the church and doctors of the church meditate on Mary here in her role, the divine motherhood. What, it, what, what does it mean to have this woman walk in the earth who is an enclosed garden, who houses God within her, who is the new ark that carries not types of Christ, but the Christ himself, who is the Lord in human form, who is the new tabernacle, the new temple, who houses God within her. The temple there on the, on the, in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, this is the second, and, and embellished the second temple of this time, of this age. It doesn't have the Shekhinah. The Holy of Holies in the second temple is empty. There's no ark. There's no glory presence of Yahweh enthroned above it. Where is it now? In this moment, it's in Mary. Mary is the new ark. And we'll come back and elaborate on that in a few moments. And she's the new tabernacle and the new temple, housing God, not as cl cloud by day, fire by night, but housing God in her womb in human form. This is the restoration of what was lost, what was destroyed in the days of the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem in, eight, in the ninth day of Ar, 587 B.C. By the way, I'll throw this in as a, as a tangent. The first and second temple were both destroyed on the same day in the Jewish calendar, the ninth day of Ar, by the Babylonians and the Romans in AD 70. That's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. It cannot be. All right, we'll move on. For behold, when the voice of your greeting came to my ears, the child of my womb leapt for joy. We already elaborated on that. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. <clears throat> so in a sense, excuse me. <coughs> St. Elizabeth is having a little go at her husband, Zachariah. Because Mary, unlike my husband, you believed. Okay? My husband's in trouble. He hasn't been able to talk for the last couple of weeks. In brackets. So things have been pretty good lately. All right? He didn't believe and he's copped it for it. But you believed and you're blessed because you believed. Okay? Now, just to make one point here. this Okay, we know the mother of my Lord defends two dogmas. Of course, the dogma of the divinity of Christ and the dogma of Mary's divine maternity, divine motherhood. She's truly the mother of God because there's only one person in her womb. And that's the second person of the Blessed Trinity, a divine person, the word made flesh. Jesus is not two persons. He's one person with two natures. And this is the mystery of the incarnation, the hypostatic union, how Jesus can have a human body, human soul, human intellect, human will, but not be a human person as well as a divine person. It's hard to fathom. But Jesus has to be one person who owns and operates the divine, the human. He's a divine person who owns and operates the human nature because it's the human nature that's sacrificed. And for that sacrifice to have infinite value, it must be owned by a divine person, not a human person. If Jesus was divine and human persons, then they would have co-owned the human nature and therefore the sacrifice on the cross could not have been infinite in value. I know this is really deep in theology and I'm going off on a tangent again, 
But this is why the Council of Chalcedon in AD 451 came to this conclusion. The Council of Ephesus in AD 431 gave the dogmatized mother of God as a valid statement for Christians to make, to utter. 451 dogmatized that Jesus is only one person, a divine person who possesses two natures, the divine and a human nature, without being a human person as well. It's a deep mystery. It still partially divides us from the um, Coptic Orthodox of Egypt, Syria, Ethiopia, and Armenia, who are non-Chalcedonian, who don't accept the Council of Chalcedon. I hope I'm not boring you, but I know so some of you are interested. I can see your heads nodding. All right. Okay. And Mary said, this is one of the greatest prayers uttered in human history. And if you have a devotion where you recite this prayer regularly, it will be great. All right. It's incredible that you get a 15-year-old girl being able to recite such a prayer. How does Luke write it down word to word, as well as the Benedictus of Zechariah? Again, it must have been transcribed somewhere in this period between, this is 3 or 2 or 1 BC when this is happening, uh, until 65 years later when Luke's writing it down. Somewhere it was transcribed. And I'm still open to the view that St. Luke knew Mary, interviewed Mary, and perhaps wrote this down himself and kept it as testimonies until he thought, look, I'll write a gospel for Theophilus. Right? It's still possible. I don't deny it. My soul magnifies the Lord. Now, this reflects the praise of the woman Hannah. Now, Hannah had been childless and she prayed and made a vow that if she got a child, she'll dedicate that child to the Lord all the days of his life. And that was the prophet Samuel. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my saviour, for he's regarded the lower state of his handmaid. So Mary was saved. God's her saviour. Mary was saved. She needed salvation. So what's this Catholic bunk about the Immaculate Conception? This false Catholic doctrine, the Immaculate Conception, that makes Mary sinless and therefore, in brackets, perhaps a goddess. Because sinlessness pertains only to God. Actually, it doesn't. There are plenty of rocks that are sinless too. Stars, planets, galaxies, trees, clouds are all sinless. They're not gods. No, okay. Mary is saved. There's two explanations for this term, God my Savior, because saving Mary, uh, lifting Mary out of her plight, her natural socioeconomic status, poor, you know, humble, um, you know, and, and re recognizing the poor and the lowly. But and we, we can come to that conclusion because in the next verse, where he's regarded the lower state of his handmaid. All right? But Mary is saved. Know this. The Immaculate Conception is not an exemption for Mary from the need for a saviour. It's how she was saved. It's the application of the merits of Christ to her in full plenitude in advance. In lieu of the cross, Mary is grace from the moment of her conception because she was going to have the most extraordinary vocation in history. She was going to be united with the divine. She was going to be the house of God on earth. Now, we've seen how God applies grace in advance to sanctify John the Baptist in the womb. He just does that at an earlier point in the case of Mary. And in a more perfect manner, so John the Baptist was saved in the womb. He was baptized in the womb by the Holy Spirit. And that was the application of the merits of Christ in advance for him. The churches teach us that with the same and more was done with respect to Mary. More perfectly, not at six months in the womb, but from the moment of her very conception. Because she was going to be more intimately involved 
in the in the mission of redemption more intimately united to god the godhead the second person than john the baptist or any other person and so there are arguments relating to appropriateness here the house of god mary on earth will not be mortgaged to the devil the devil have no influence no power over mary and over the house of god on earth for behold henceforth all generations will call me blessed who fulfills that prophecy? Last Saturday, I was getting my back, that physiotherapy on my lower back. I, the young fellow doing it's a Lebanese guy like most of you guys I see in front of me, and he's, he belongs to the Faith Baptist community in, in Reesby. Five, four years ago, he left the Maronite faith and joined them. And I think he's just another victim of a poor Catholic education, and he comes across people who are passionate, enthusiastic, who think they know the Bible, but they actually, they don't. I've debated them many years ago. And for half an hour, while I'm on my stomach and he's massaging my back, we're debating theology, scripture, and all that. That was a lot of fun. Now, I forgot to mention this point here. He was shocked. He was shocked. I don't think he wants to see me again. <laughs> because he, he, he's never heard all these arguments before. But there's one argument I'm going to give him next time. Do you fulfill this prophecy? Do you call Mary blessed? All generations call me blessed. Now, there are some Protestants who just pour scorn over any Catholic teacher with respect to Mary, and they don't want to give Mary any accolades whatsoever. She's just the eggshell. Crack, get what's necessary and throw out. But there are other Protestants more intelligent, um, more reasonable, who want to acknowledge Mary as a great Christian woman in the line of other great women of the Old and New Testament. Some of them will be able to, would, would be willing to call her blessed, but that's, that doesn't come out of their mouths like it comes out of Catholic mouths. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, Rob, what, I always wondered, what, why, why don't they live as a mother of God? Oh, because it's simple. The term's not in scripture. I kept coming back to this young fellow on Saturday. Every time you say, I don't believe it because it's not in scripture, I started my counter argument by saying, This view that it has to be in scripture, sola scriptura, is not in scripture. You need to show me, Michael, where sola scriptura has been revealed by God. You believe in sola scriptura? meaning the Bible alone, and I won't believe in anything unless it's in the Bible. And if it's not in the Bible, I don't believe it. Okay, that's a standard Protestant position. Well, that's a, that's a dogmatic belief you have, Mike. Where does it come from? Show me, where was it revealed by God? It's not revealed in Scripture. And if it's not revealed in Scripture, then it's not revealed at all for you. By the way, where does the contents page come from? The contents page of the Bible, where does it come from? The Old Testament, the New Testament, list of books. Where does it come from, Mike? You talk about the Word of God, but how do you know it's the Word of God? I got Muslims who tell me the Quran's the Word of God. So how do we know that your twenty-seven books in the New Testament really belong to the New Testament, other Word of God? Who who first taught that? Who put the contents page together, Mike? And the poor fellow was just left foundering. Because implicitly in their mind, it's the word of God, and it's come down as if it came, came down in an elevator. <laughs> Complete, bound as well. King James Version. No, it wasn't. It certainly wasn't the King James Version. All right. Okay. But what I've learned over the years is stay nice, stay friends. So that's, that's the only re reason why we can continue. And I got my full massage. All right. <laughs> okay. All right, for he was mighty, has done great things for me. That's a key phrase there. When we've got these Marian dogmas, when we say Mary's mother of God, immaculate conception, perpetual virgin, assumed into heaven, and all these other titles that we grant to her, we must always come back to where it comes from. Mary is an independent. She's not a creature who has these privileges by by her own nature by you know independent of god it is god that has done these things for her everything that we ha she has every grace every glory 
Every privilege has come from God. To serve what end? The incarnation. The coming of God in human form. Okay. And we must, when we help our non-Catholic friends see that, then they calm down a little. And holy is his name, and his mercy is, from is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Now, this deserves an hour unpacking in its own right, but I, we don't have the time. So I'll just highlight certain, certain parts. So there's emphasis, emphasis here on God, God's mercy, because salvation is a grace and an act of mercy. When our Protestant brothers and sisters say that, you know, I'm saved by grace, as Michael did on Saturday. So I agree with you. I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. So am I. I agree with you. Right? Salvation is a gift. We could never have compelled God to come in human form to save us. We had no right to it. It is a gift. It is a grace. If God was strict justice, he could have easily have decreed, but I made it clear to you what the law was and what the consequence, consequences would be if you breached the law and you went ahead and you willfully breached the law. You now suffer the consequences. It's over. Game over. Sorry. That's your lot. And we have no right to complain. But for the sake of subsequent generations after Adam and Eve, who weren't there, who were suffering the consequences of their sin, God has mercy out of his love and graciousness for Adam and Eve and all their children. And that's the gift of salvation. And that's the mercy that's now being rolled out here through Mary, through Elizabeth, he has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of low degree. Who are the mighty at that time? Augustus Caesar in Rome. The Herodians in Jerusalem. And other kingdoms in the Indus Valley, in China, you know, uh, in Persia, Parthia, et cetera, et cetera. And other tribal nations in Africa, in the Americas, in Australia, et cetera, et cetera. The house of David at this point, as I said previously, is disempowered, impoverished, dispossessed, insignificant, reduced, unseen, unknown. That house is going to be re-exalted. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich empty away. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his posterity forever. We see here Mary understands. In, the, in this song of praise, we have a reflection of Hannah's song of praise. We have a woman who knows many of the Psalms. They're listed here. Psalm 89, Psalm 98, Psalm 111. She knows prophets like Habakkuk. She knows the book of Sirach even, quoted in the Magnificat. We have a young woman who understands the covenants with the house of David in 2 Samuel 7, with Abraham in Genesis 12, 17 and 22. How does she know all this? In a culture where 99.999% of girls never had a formal education out of the home, where only perhaps 10% of boys had an education outside of the home, there were specialist schools, Shammai, Halal, for example, the two that we know. Because Mary had a formal education. Where do we find this? It's not in scripture. It's not in scripture, I won't believe it. But it's in other sources that we can give credibility to. Why do we give credibility to the lives of the Caesars, Livy's, or Tacitus, or Suetonius, and their histories of Rome? Or Herodotus, he was a liar, Herodotus, but we know that. Thucydides, other historians, we give them some credibility. 
There are other sources outside of scripture, like the Proto-Evangelium of St. James, written in the mid-2nd century, which tell us the early life of Mary, the child of St. Joachim and St. Anne, and how they suffered because our child was for a long time, and what they did to offer prayer and sacrifice in order for them to have a child, and the promise they made to... To pray, if they are blessed with a child, to dedicate her to the temple, which they did at the age of three. So you have Titian from the Renaissance, late Renaissance, producing this wonderful painting of Mary being presented in the temple at the age of three. And where, according to this work, the Proto Evangelium, she stays for 10 years in the apartment of virgins, where she serves the needs of the priests and she's receives a formal education. So she knows Hebrew, she knows scripture. And at the age of 13, she's declared to be now, she must marry. And they arrange the marriage and they have a lot and the lot falls to Joseph. Right? And fills some of our gaps. Now, I like to believe all that stuff. I have no problem to believe it. It's not scripture, so we don't have to be dogmatic about it, but it fills gaps. How does Mary come to have this knowledge of scripture and this ability to recite such a wonderful prayer extempore, just off the top of her mouth, from the top of her mouth, off the top of her head, etc. All right. So, and Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. It's a strange place to put that text because it gives the impression that Mary doesn't stay after that. Mary's not going to be around when John the Baptist is born. But I think he just rounds it off here. She will remain and she will be there for the birth of John the Baptist because how do we know about it? She must have been present, kept these things in her heart and related them later to others who wrote it all down. We have six names in this room. I'm conscious of the time. This is so rich, it's incredible. Okay. All right, we have six people in the room. <clears throat> Zach Elizabeth, Zachariah, John, Jesus, Mary, Joseph. Each one of those names have meanings. Your names all have meanings. Put your hand up if you know the meaning of your name. What's your name? Angel. What does it mean? Angel. It means messenger. <laughs> <laughs> this is what angel means. Angel means messenger. Okay, anyone else? Anyone else? <coughs> Your name? Solange. Solange, what does that mean? I always suppose individual angel, but must be individual messenger. <laughs> you are correct. All right. <laughs> I can see how it means that. You see, we're woeful, aren't we? We, in, we are suffering from nominalism, where we're given names, we don't even know what the meaning of the names are. I know what Robert means, it's Germanic, it means like shining bright. <coughs> Haddad means Smith, nothing glamorous. <laughs> All right. But see, in the ancient world, Old and New Testament, names had significance. Children were given names because the names would have been in honour of an ancestor, like a grandparent, or the name, especially if given by God, like Abram becomes Abraham, Jacob becomes Israel, and Mary is Dahuad, Grace, Kekaratomene, and Simon becomes Peter. When the divine gives a name, the name is given deliberately, and it's a name that reflects something about the, that person innately or something about their mission, their vocation. So Elizabeth means God gives an oath or God makes a promise. We find that promise in Genesis 3.15. It's a promise of a new Adam and Eve who rescue us from the calamity of the first Adam. Yep. Zachariah means Yahweh remembers. God makes a promise. He remembers that promise. John means... Well, it's Yahane. Yahweh is gracious. Yahweh is a gift giver. God makes a promise. He remembers that promise. 
and it's a promise to give a gift. And the gift is Jesus. The gift is salvation through Jesus. Now, Jesus wasn't his name in the village. Shock horror. No one called him Jesus in that. They didn't. Someone has it right. I saw it at St. Charles today. Someone arrived with a license plate and they had the right name of Jesus on the license plate. And I love Yeshua. Jesus is what we call him in English, derived from the Greek, Jesus, Jesus, which is a transliteration of Joshua, Yeshua in Hebrew. So when Jesus is there in Nazareth growing up, they called him Yeshua or Joshua, which means Yahweh saves. That's the gift, salvation. God makes a promise, who remembers that promise, the promise to give a gift. It's the gift of salvation through Jesus, who comes to us through Mary. Now, Mary is equivocal, has many meanings. It's not even a Jewish name originally, even though there's plenty of Marys in John 19 at the foot of the cross. Our Lady Mary, St. Mary Magdalene, Mary, Mother of James and Joseph, uh, Mary Salome, plenty of Marys, but Mary's not originally Jewish. It's originally Egyptian. And Mary can mean little, no, Mary. Miriam, the sister of Moses, means stubborn. Well, that doesn't fit our narrative here. Mary, if Mary was stubborn, she would have told the angel, no thanks. Okay. All right. Of course, she didn't do that. And then Mare in Latin means ocean or sea. Mara means bitter waters. But Mary also means the beloved. And how appropriate. God makes a promise. The prom uh, he remembers that promise. The promise to give a gift. Gift of salvation through Jesus. It comes to us through Mary, the beloved. And by the way, theologically, it wasn't sufficient for Jesus to come into the world with a true human nature, die on the cross, rise from the dead, and, and that did everything he does as recorded in the gospel. That wouldn't have been sufficient in God's mind from the perspective of justice. Because if Jesus just turned up into the world, like walked through the door as a full-on adult, He's not connected with the human family. He needs out of justice to be connected with the human family. Actually, biologically, because it's the human family that did the sin, that offended God. And it's the human family that must do the act of reparation. So Jesus must join that human family in order to offer that infinite reparation on the cross on behalf of the human family. And how does he become a member of the human family? Only through Mary's yes. Now don't tell me Mary's role is not important or is optional. It's not. And who's the last one we haven't mentioned? Poor old Joseph. Joseph doesn't get as much of a show here. Doesn't say anything in Matthew's gospel. It's not even mentioned in Luke's gospel. Poor fellow. Joseph means Yahweh rebuilds. Or Yahweh gives increase, which is Yahweh rebuilds. And that's what he does. God makes a promise. He remembers that promise. The promise to give a gift. The gift of salvation through Jesus. Who comes to us through the beloved. And in coming to us, rebuilds the family of God. God the Father. We're brothers and sisters through baptism. We come together as a family through what? The Eucharist. The heavenly food given to us by God the Father. We live that out every day in the church. And if you come go to a mass that's a clown mass, walk out, because that's not appropriate. We want reverent masses. Is that a question at the back? You had your hand up? That's right. That's okay. Well, questions are welcome. All right. Okay, I'm noting the time. All right. 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth to be delivered. She gave birth to a son. And the neighbours and kinsfolk heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her. And they rejoiced with her. And remember, the Virgin Mary is still here. She's still present. And remember, 
the great stigma, the social stigma has been lifted on St. Elizabeth. Barrenness. Again, our society, our culture today is twisted out of shape. We celebrate barrenness. We demand barrenness. We fight for barrenness. That's why we're fighting for contraception. We're fighting for abortion. We're fighting for sterilization. Because this is not a society that is in good standing with God, I assure you. God is in conception. He's not in contraception. All right? Barrenness is a curse. That's why when you look at the church today and you see dying religious orders and empty seminaries, something has gone wrong there. They lost their way. They lost their charism. They lost their fidelity to Catholic truth. And that's why they become an empty house. Empty house is barrenness, is a curse. God is in blessing, in fruitfulness. God is in conception, not contraception. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. Verse 59. The eighth day. Christianity is the eighth day, by the way. The resurrection of Christ is the eighth day. It's the first day of the recreation. All right? That's why in some ancient churches in the Middle East, you find the baptismal font is an octagon shape, eight sides. Because you've been reborn, recreated through baptism. Christ recreates on the first day of the second week, the eighth day. This is the circumcision is equivalent is Jewish baptism in a sense. <coughs> it's always done on the eighth day, irrespective of what day of the week it was, even the Sabbath. It's done in the house of the father, of the child. The priest comes to do it, the Kohen. Zechariah, I don't know if he did it himself here. Certainly he could have because he was a priest, but others would have been invited and maybe um, another priest did it. It's the day the child officially receives his or her name. It's the day the child is incorporated into the covenant with Abraham, Genesis 17. If John the Baptist or Jesus were not circumcised, they would not have been incorporated officially into the people of God in the covenant with Abraham. They would have been automatically rejected as false prophets and non-Jews, right? Uh, one, one commentary I read says that circumcision had the effect of forgiving original sin in the recipient, giving them sanctifying grace. If a child died without being circumcised beforehand, they would, have been, they would have been saved by the faith of their parents in the future Messiah. Similar to what baptism does today. Baptism is more powerful, though as a sacrament. And you notice here, what's done with infants, this argument, oh, but you've got to give the child a, a say in it. Oh, why was I baptized? I wasn't asked, no one asked me permission to be baptized. This is, well, all Protestants say we shouldn't baptize infants because they don't know what's going on. Does that matter to God? God's gracious. This is a gift. The child here in being baptized at the age of eight days is receiving a blessing, a gift. Even more so with the child being baptized. In God's original plan for humanity, each child would have been put in sanctifying grace as soon as they were conceived in their mother's womb through no choice of their own. Grace is a gift. Why complain about it? Because of original sin, however, each child is conceived and born without grace, disgraced, wounded, prone to sin, excluded from heaven through no choice of their own. So when we have infant baptism, it's the closest thing we can do to restore God's original plan for humanity of placing infants in grace as early as possible, because that was God's original plan for humanity. Children will be conceived and born in grace through no choice of their own. So why do we complain about it now? Oh, because it's not in the Bible. 
But where does it, where is sola scriptura as a doctrine in the Bible? What's in the Bible is that there's a church who has authority to bind and loose, to make teach, to, to, to teach, to govern the sanctified. And the church teacher, the church of Christ teaches infant baptism as a restoration of God's original plan for children. And they would have named him Zechariah after his father, but his mother said, not so, he shall be called John. She probably got that from the angel Gabriel herself, or Zechariah wrote it down on a, on, a, on a chalkboard for her. And they said to her, but none of your kindred is called by this name. In other words, you're going against cultural norms, which are very strong cultural norms. And they made signs to, the, to his father inquiring what he would have him called because it's the prerogative of the, prerogative of the father to name the child, not the mother. But we saw last week, the angel Gabriel said to Mary, and you shall call him Jesus. Why? Because Joseph had no role in it, naturally. Later on, Joseph would be told the same thing, to name him Jesus, keep harmony in the family. All right. Okay. And then, and he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And they were all marveled. Wow. They didn't understand why. Why are they both in agreement here? Elizabeth and Zachariah to name the child a, a name that's not in the tradition of the family. And again, remember, Names are not given accidentally here. John, Yahanan, Yahweh is gracious. This is, a, 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 John is to be a sign, a witness to God's graciousness uh, in the now coming Messiah. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke blessing God and fear came on all their neighbours. And I can imagine that. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all heard them laid up, up in their hearts, saying, what then will be this child? For the hand of the Lord was with him. Now, you see, laid, this term laid up in their hearts, we'll see it. Luke will give that phrase again twice with respect to Mary. These things are remembered. And they'll be eventually put down in writing. We have a lot to thank Luke for, for giving us this gospel. Otherwise, we'd know none of this. What would this child grow to be? Now, some people would be speculating even then, maybe the Messiah. They don't know. And as we will see later on, in John's gospel, chapter one, there are many who speculated that this wild man baptizing in the river Jordan was perhaps the Messiah. Verse 67, now I'm conscious of the time and I want to give quality time to unpacking Zachariah's prophecy. By the way, this analogy of Mary and Ark of the Covenant, I'll give you some points to it. Well, not these points, other points. All right, well, I'll give you these points and some other points. Yeah. Mary rose and went with haste. We saw that at the beginning of this discussion. David arose and went into the same region centuries earlier to retrieve the Ark of the Covenant. This is analogy, comparison. Mary stayed in the house of Zechariah for three months, recalling how the Ark of the Covenant was temporarily stationed in the house of Obadidon for three months. When the Ark was in the house of Obadidon, the Ark of the Covenant, the original, there was place there because when David retrieved the ark from the Philistines, the, the Philistines abandoned the ark because it was bringing devastation to them, plagues. And the funny, it's a really, it's a funny story. The Philistines won this terrible victory over the, the Jews and they captured the ark. It was a calamity. And they got this trophy, this war trophy of Jews and they put it in their temple, Dagon, in front of their statue. Dagon was a god who had a fish head. All right, and they put the the ark there in front of the god Dagon, and all these plagues began to break out: pestilence, rats, statue of Dagon, 
one day they found in the morning prostrate collapse in front of the ark what's going on here the philistine says so they put the statue back up on this pedestal the next morning they came back the statue was again collapsed and again but broken to pieces the philistines eventually got the message this thing is dangerous you know it's not that the philistines didn't believe in yahweh they just believed that their gods were more powerful than the jewish gods or the gods of the israel the god of the israelites okay so they wouldn't believe that yahweh may be existed it's just a, he's invisible not as powerful as they the to the, to the yeah they abandoned it they put it they dumped it and they retrieved it and they brought it on a they brought it on a cart now one thing about the ark you weren't allowed to touch it it could it only be carried around through poles placed through the two rings on either side four rings and only carried around by levites priests with sacred hands and this poor fellow named Uza. The ark has been brought back to Jerusalem along the road. And the ark hits a rock. Sorry, the, the, the carriage hits a rock. And the, and the car carriage turns over and the ark is going to fall to the ground. And Uzzah, the good man that he was, didn't want to see this sacred relic you know, be damaged. So he, he put his hands up to stop it falling on the ground. He dropped dead because it was the law you cannot touch the ark with unconsecrated hands i see some faces here rather bewildered but this is what happened. david was angry and fearful so they put the house the ark in the house of Abba edom for three months before they brought it back to jerusalem and fertility came to the house of Abba edom during that time yes is that a good defense for various potential virginity that's right you see the ark and i'll go through these points here then i'll come to that Mary stayed in three months, temporary station in the house of Abedidom. Like the golden chest, she's a sacred vessel where the Lord's presence dwells intimately with his people. So the ark was overshadowed. It was a throne of God on earth. There's mercy seat at the top. How's God? The Shekinah Kabod, cloud by day, fire by night. Now with Mary, how does the ark represent the four dogmas of Mary? Well, mother of God. Because the ark carried Aaron's priestly rod, an original copy of the Ten Commandments, and a bowl of manna from heaven. They're all types of Christ, who is the high priest of the order of Melchizedek, who is the ultimate lawgiver, the new Moses, and who comes to us as the new bread from heaven, the Eucharist. So the ark carried types of Christ, but Mary as ark carried Christ himself. Mother of God, perpetual virgin. No one was allowed to touch the ark. No man was allowed to touch the ark. No man touched Mary. So that law of don't touch the ark reflected Mary, the dogma of Mary's perpetual virginity. Forget the dogmas here, sorry. Mother of God, uh, immaculate conception, yeah. That comes before perpetual virgin. Immaculate conception, the ark was made of acacia wood and covered in gold, incorruptible. Gold doesn't rust, even though St. James says in his apostle, in his epistle, that it might rust, doesn't rust. Okay. Meaning, meaning it's stainless. That reflects Mary's stainlessness, stainless status. Sinlessness, perpetual, sorry, the immaculate conception. We've already looked at um, perpetual virginity. And the fourth one is the assumption. The ark disappears. When the Babylonians came to Jerusalem on that fateful day, the 9th of Ar, 587 BC, everything's destroyed. Jeremiah, the prophet, takes the ark and hides it in the cave. Disappears. Never to be found again. Not even Hollywood found it. Hollywood makes a movie in 1984, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Funny movie, harmless to watch, right? Nazis cop it at the end, but um, terribly. But that's fantasy. That's Hollywood fantasy. The Ark disappears. It's buried and it disappears, symbolizing the assumption of Mary, who dies, is buried, and then disappears, assumed into heaven. So we see that the ark is a true type of Mary. In those ways, so the ark of the covenant, Mary, as, as the ark of the covenant in the Old Testament, 
is a type of a greater, the antitype, Mary, who's also an ark, but much superior because Mary is endowed with sanctifying grace, not just covered in gold. Mary houses the God-man, not just symbols of the Messiah. Mary is overshadowed by the Holy Spirit at the Annunciation. In the same way, the ancient ark was overshadowed by the Shekinah. So we see here restoration. In the second temple, as I told you, there was no ark in the Holy of Holies. There was no Shekinah. The high priest, the sacrifice, um, the feast of Yom Kippur, the scapegoat, the, 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 the lamb, the bull, the scapegoat, there was no presence of God in the temple. When did the second temple get its ark and its glory? The presentation of the baby Jesus in the temple. When Mary came as ark, now the ark carried but also enthroned, and Mary carried Christ and enthroned him in his arms when she brought him to the temple that day, the presentation of the infant Jesus in the temple. That day, the second temple got its ark and it got its glory. The glory was Christ, God in human form. That's when the second temple was complete. Most people don't see that. They don't know that. All right, where are we up to? Good. So we go to verse 67, and his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's here everywhere, isn't it? You know, normally we associate the Holy Spirit with coming at Pentecost. Comes in plenitude, in power. It's the birthday of the church. It's 50 days after Jesus uh, rises from the dead. The Holy Spirit is existing and working and sanctifying before Christ even manifests in the world. Remember, these are all graces given in lieu of the cross was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. This is a magnificent prayer as well, but not so surprising from an older man, highly educated, who's a priest, very learned, okay? For he has visited and redeemed his people. Now, Zechariah illustrates two views of the Messiah in this canticle. One partially valid, one entirely valid. The great mistake of the Jewish nation is that most people are held to the partially valid view. What's this partially valid view? He has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Okay. Most Jews believed at this time and 30 years later that the Messiah would be a great warrior king, like Judas Maccabeus and more so in the house of David. He would appear, he would be born in Bethlehem, but uh, besides that, they know not where he would come from. He would be, as I said, a king visibly, visible, worldly and warrior, and he would have an army. He would raise an army. And he would be backed up by angels. And he would go to war against the Romans and purify the original land of the 12 tribes of all pagan domination and influence. The Romans will be cast out. All Greco-Roman and all other pagan influences cast out. And this victorious messianic figure kingly messianic figure, would then be enthroned on Mount Zion, southwest of the temple, and reign undisturbed to the end of time. And according to Isaiah, he will be the light to the Gentiles. The rest of the world will come to know the true God, Yahweh, through this glorious, victorious messianic figure. Sounds great, doesn't it? Wonderful. As, you'll, as we know later on, Jesus doesn't tick those boxes. Doesn't declare war on the Romans. Doesn't have any army. Uneducated. No power. No wealth. As for casting out the Romans, he said, pay taxes to Caesar. You don't tell anyone in the Middle East to pay taxes. <laughs> let alone to Caesar. Right? Love your enemies. What do you mean love your enemies? We're here to wipe out the Romans. 
and he didn't tick the boxes. The most of the Jews were stuck in that rut, that image of the Messiah. Redemption meant not freeing us from the dominion of the devil, restoring us to the grace of God. It meant liberating the Jewish people from the yoke of the Romans and the pagan and reuniting the original 12 lands of the 12 tribes into a restored visible kingdom greater than the days of David and Solomon. Horn means it's a symbol of power. For us in the house of the servant David, yes, the house of David will be restored according to 2 Samuel 7, okay? But the house of David here was not going to be the original Israel, but a new Israel. That's why Jesus calls 12 as his disciples, he sends out 12, as his, uh, 12 out as apostles because he's rebuilding Israel. The original Israel is based on the 12 sons, the 12 tribes, the sons of Jacob. And that had completely fallen apart. And the remnant of the remnant would remain through which the Messiah would come into the world. This old Israel will be reconstituted, but it's a new Israel. Through the Jews, for the Jews, but through the Jews for the rest of humanity as well. And this is the rebuilding of the house of David, which, as I said last week, was the restoration of the house of Jacob as well, more so. And he spoke, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all those who hate us. So this is that view, this limited, restrictive view, even false view, that the role of the Messiah was to be this warrior messianic king. Okay. Now, Zechariah would have held to this view to some extent. That's forgivable at that time. It was the predominant expectation with respect to the Messiah. But then Zechariah goes on to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. So here we have the learned Zechariah aware of the covenants, going back to Abraham. Okay that there'll be one who would come, who'd be through a descendant of Abraham, who'd be a blessing to all the nations. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us. Now, the oath to Abraham was also land, many descendants, and one of those descendants would be a blessing to all the nations. What the Jews, or many of the Jews forgot, was that this land and many descendants were, was for the sake of the third promise, one who would be a blessing to all the nations, not just the Hebrews. Now, you've got to distinguish here between Hebrews, Israelites, and Jews. Hebrews equals Israelites, but Jews were only one tribe of the Israelites. Okay. The oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies. Again, this view that, you know, redemption, salvation has been saved by the, from the pagan, from the Romans. Might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. So again, when you're reading that, you see that Zechariah, he's preoccupied with this limited view of the Messiah. All right. Great days are going to come to Israel. We're going to be restored. We're going to serve, and, when, and through this restoration, we'll be able to really serve Yahweh faithfully. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. Oh, by the way, going back to verse 69, form of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Well, neither Zechariah or John were of the house of David. Because our Levites, the house of David, were Jews of the tribe of Judah. So here Zechariah is knowing that his son, this son he's just received now and circumcised, is not going to be the Messiah. And he re re really, he really iterates that when he says in verse 76, a new child will be called prophet of the Most High. While Jesus was son of the Most High. There's a dis great distinction there. Prophet of the Most High, son of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. 
Now here, Zechariah has a clear knowledge of Isaiah 40, that there's, the Messiah will have a precursor, some who will level all mountains and fill all valleys. Right? So here Zechariah is correct. My child, John, is going to not be the Messiah, He's going to be a prophet of the Most High, the last and greatest prophet of the Old Testament, and he's going to prepare the way for the Messiah to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Ah, so in verse 77, here we have Zechariah having knowledge of, more accurate knowledge of the real role of the Messiah. It's going to go beyond this temporal, military, messianic, messianic king. This, the Messiah will also be responsible for achieving forgiveness of our sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, when the day shall dawn upon us from on high, this language is, you know, the day dawning upon us, the imagery of light casting out darkness. Humanity is in the darkness of sin. And this son, John, as the precursor to the Messiah, are going to open a new day of light upon the world to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Again, this is a, in verse 79, is a reiteration of the promise to Abraham that he would have a descendant who would be a blessing to all the nations. This blessing to all the nations will liberate the nations from darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. And he concludes here by saying, and the child grew and became strong in spirit. And he was in the wilderness to the day of his manifestation to Israel. That's a big jump, isn't it? So we have the canticle of Zechariah. We have this moment where John is just eight days old. He's circumcised. And the next thing Luke tells us, or the only thing he can tell us, according to the data he's got, is that this child really withdraws into the background for the next 30 years. This child, John, and his relative, Jesus, in the visitation event in Ein Karim are in the same room. And we have no record of them ever meeting again, coming into contact again, until they are adults 30 years plus. John gives us the first encounter between the two as adults in his John chapter one. As mentioned this last week, when John is with his disciples and he's baptizing. And who approaches? Jesus. And John says, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That statement alone deserves one hour to unpack. Because John has a clear view of the role of the Messiah. To say this person is the lamb who will take away the sin of the world, so that so John understands that he will be sacrificed. He will be a suffering Messiah, not a glorified Messiah with a crown on his head, reigning undisturbed at the end of time, but is going to be slaughtered like the lamb in the temple, crucified, drained of peace, Drained of all blood. Robert, sorry, yeah. why, why is that? Why is that? I mean, why is Zachariah, what, Zachariah would have known yeah. that Mary was carrying the Messiah. the Messiah. Yeah. I mean, she spent three months there, so there would have been lots of talk over the United States, what's going on. But why why is that why are they keeping St. John away from Jesus? Why, why is there nothing in the I, I well the answer to your question is that I don't know why they are kept separate for decades. I wouldn't say they are deliberately kept separate. I just think circumstances, you know, the world was different then. But we all, all I can say is that we know when Jesus is born, 
we have details as to his infancy, the need to escape to Egypt, a few years there. Herod's not come out after John the Baptist. Jesus is forced out of the country. When they return, the aim is to settle in Bethlehem because they are descendants of David, but because Archelaus is reigning in that territory in succession to his father, Herod the Great, and he was very much like his father, megalomaniac murder. They decide to go up north. John, from what we can tell, becomes a Nazarite. That's not someone from Nazareth. That's someone who lives very ascetic life under vow, who will never cut his hair, never shave his beard, always wear rough clothing, camel's hair, eating locusts and honey, and that's how we're introduced to him. And he would have been, we have also evidence that perhaps he lived with the Essene community out there in Qumran, all part of his own preparation. So, that's the best I can give you. That's the most. Saint John the Baptist was educated. Well, if he was with the Essenes, he would have been educated because they had a very extensive literature, and and, and they created their own library. And they would have had they had biblical texts in that library, and they had their own writings and their own rule. We know that from all the documents that we've recovered from the various caves there since 1947. Yes. Um, I've read that the church fathers believe that they were separated was because they were second cousins and that there would be no bias in that John the Baptist knowing that Jesus was the Messiah. Yeah. He knowing him to be the Messiah, not because they were cousins, but because he knew him through some form of revelation. Yeah. And there's no doubt when you when you read John 1, you come to the conclusion that John would have received his own private revelation as to Jesus of Nazareth being the Messiah and his true mission. No one would have taught John um, the true mission of Jesus of Nazareth. It would have had to have been revealed to him privately, directly. All right. I started five minutes late, so I'm open to a few questions and we can finish in five minutes or whenever you like. But I won't go more than five minutes. All right. Well, thank you then. Uh, it was, I mean, you can ask questions. But at this time, most of you would like, yes. So, you know, it's on that notion of the Father Max, the doll. Uh, yeah. So, um, when, since Sacrifice was weird for uh, John and Horn, they were saying, uh, like in, in verse 59, it was, um, they were saying, and they were, to go, they were going to name him Zachariah, his father. Yeah. They're referring back to his neighbors and relatives. Who's they? Now, they would mean is that mean is Zachariah and Elizabeth is the Zay. They would have named him. I mean, they would be the, the expectation of everyone present. Right? That's the Zay. By the way, something I forgot to mention about the visitation event for our own information. I challenge um, people sometimes, I say, show me where the Old Testament ends and the New Testament begins. So I give them a Catholic Bible and they dig through. And this is people I work with on the retreats. The record is eight seconds. It's a Lebanese fellow who's an REC in one of our schools. So he went to, he found, he went to the last book in the Old Testament, normally in the Catholic Old Testament. Um, they list either Malachi or Zechariah as the last book in the Old Testament. Even though the Deuterocanonicals were written later, right, they embed them earlier than the books of Malachi or Zechariah. And then the next book in the Old New Testament is the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. Well, there's a problem with that because the books of either Malachi or Zechariah are written in the 5th century BC, 500 years before Matthew. The Judeo-Canonicals, they're the seven extra books in the Catholic Old Testament written in Greek, are written between 200 and 100 BC. So where does the Old Testament end and the New Testament begins? It really begins, the Old Testament and then ends and the New Testament begins with, at the event, the visitation. Those six people in that room again, those six I named, three of them are strictly Old Testament figures, Zechariah, Elizabeth, John the Baptist. 
Three of them are Old Testament figures that grow into the New Testament. Jesus, Mary, Joseph. Okay. But the turning of this page from the Old to the New Testament isn't done in a few seconds. It's done over decades. All right. They, it begins in the visitation when those six are in that room. And it ends when John the Baptist is arrested and imprisoned in that fortress in Macarius on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And only when John the Baptist is in prison does Jesus go public, begins to preach, and preach, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of God is at hand. And when John the Baptist is beheaded, that's when the Old Testament formally ends. And with Jesus beginning to preach publicly, that's the beginning of the New Testament era, formally. All right? So that's when the Old Testament, that's the hinge between the Old and the New Testament. But that hinge takes 30 years to turn. All right. If there's no more questions, we can finish there. Great. Thank you. Okay, before we finish in the crowd, I just want to remind everyone Hannah has put up a few sections where there's a QR code. And if you want to scan this section, which is the wrong 